ஜெய் ஸ்ரீராம் வணக்கம் அண்ட் நமஸ்காரம் my mind is actually bursting with thoughts and possibilities especially after hearing this man speak i'm usually known for speaking extempore i never go with any kind of preparation because i believe 24 by 7 is the preparation mode i don't prepare for any event but the number of ideas that kept bursting in my head when he was talking my template was one he's just uh, multiplied it so let me thank shivashree for giving me an opportunity to share space with kamaraj 2.0 in 2022 i think i had the opportunity to call him tamil nadu in tamarai Kamaraj 2.0 why one because it's time that bharat had the third prime minister from the south but before that தமிழ்நாட்டுக்கு பிடிச்ச அந்த புற்றுநோய் நைன்டீன் சிக்ஸ்டி செவன்ல அது முதல்ல ஒழியணும் தட் வைரஸ் தட் ஹேஸ் கிரிப்ட் த ஹோலி ஸ்டேட் ஆஃப் தமிழ்நாடு திஸ் தார்மிக் லேண்ட் நீட்ஸ் டு பி அராடிகேட்டட் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் காலம் சமயம் டைம் ஹஸ் ஃபைனலி கிவன் ஹஸ் திஸ் ஆப்ஷன் i request the dharmikas in tamil nadu the hindus of tamil nadu to throw their weight behind this man i am making this public it is now or never this is a do or die battle 2026 anj pushkaram 60 years mudinjirukom since 1967 it is time to take a decision you have to mean business every vote matters every middle class vote every thinking vote must not think of it as a holiday must go out in the sun and do whatever is necessary we are just 2 years away this was not meant to be a political speech but unfortunately our land has been heavily politicized our religion has been politicized i am left with no other option but to speak about this bluntly when we speak of think like a bharatiya and since he has touched upon the topic of secularism i am happy he has actually done that over the last 3 years something tectonic has taken place and i think it's important for people to take note of it i am speaking in tamil primarily because there's a youtube audience that's watching rather in english because there's a youtube uh, audience that's watching and ennoda tamil selu perukku pidikadu one decolonization has finally entered indian political discourse and that's a fantastic victory the tragedy is that this conversation should have started in 1947 and it has started in 2020s no other post colonial independent society can boast of this kind of prolonged mental slavery ever i know what people like me have gone through in tamil nadu i've witnessed it on campuses i have suffered the consequences of it but the only promise and sankalpa i made to myself was that i will never become a jati activist i will speak for the community as a whole i 
I have no pretensions or delusions of becoming a leader at all under any circumstances or a representative, but I will certainly ensure that every ounce of my energy and brain is used to support people like him. Because I think it's time we did away with the concept of politicians and we think of thinking leaders. This is what we want. People who understand the concept of Raja Dharmam. That is crucial. That takes me to the concept of secularism. Because anybody who understands the history of secularism will tell you that secularism is political conversion. Its job is to sever your roots, your connection with your roots. Its entire purpose is to make sure that you forget your past. And it becomes the new religion because humankind cannot survive without religion. Therefore, secularism has become the new religion, unfortunately. The purpose of these tools is to ensure that you forget one of the most important, let's say, concept in the life of dharmikas, which is pitris, ancestors, your people, your forefathers. That is why I call it political conversion, because conversion requires you to spit on your past and to embrace a new identity that's completely antagonistic to your earlier identity. Hence, it is political conversion. Knowing fully well that this would be the problem, that it's a time bomb that's going to burst itself on a regular basis against the indigenous community, the framers of the constitution chose not to use the word secularism as part of the preamble at all. All those fears, all those apprehensions have been vindicated with time to our detriment. To our detriment. There was a time when there was a different kind of a procession taken out of the Kanchi Matam in 2004. Finally, this man has gone to Kanchi. As a proud follower of the Kanchi Matam, I am super happy. Think like a Bharatiya. You can't think like a Bharatiya as long as you embrace secularism is my humble submission. <laughs> it is cognitive dissonance. If you think like a Bharatiya and also wear secularism as a badge of honor, you can't. They are incompatible. They are mutually destructive. And they are mutually exclusive. Tamil Nadu ke vidhi moksha kada kiri varke, Bharat ke vidhi moksha kada kya aade. People like Dushyant Sridhar and others will continue to do what they will do on a public platform. But until this becomes a social, cultural revolution, don't expect people like him to fight this battle alone. It is impossible for us to survive and come out unscathed in this battle unless and until you realize that it is not your job anymore to simply outsource even your cultural battles to the politician. Because this battle is being, is being waged on your streets, in restaurants, in movie theaters. Dare I say more? I can. And the worst part is this cancer has entered the rest of the south. Bhakti should have been the biggest export of Tamil Nadu. This Dravidianist cancer is being exported to the rest of the south. In my living memory, I have never seen a separatist sentiment being expressed on the Dharmika state of Karnataka ever. Even that has happened because the way this cancer enters is actually true and consistent to its origins, which is cinema, which is art. So that's how it has entered Telangana and Andhra Pradesh through movies. That's how it has entered Karnataka. Kerala, of course, never needed it because it has its own cancer. Parashrama Kshetram should have been known for a different red. It is being known for a different red. <laughs> so the point is, this civilization is a dharmic civilization. Own it, embrace it, be proud of it. That is fundamentally decolonization. 
If someone says, does it mean that we should embrace everything about the past? When every time I speak of decolonization, I get this nonsensical statement, I'm, I'm, I'm forced to say, does it mean that you have to spit on your past? No, you don't have to. These are not binaries. Anyone who chooses to focus exclusively on the problems of the past is not a well-wisher of this civilization because according to him, there is nothing positive worth being discussed. You have to look at the entire history of the civilization as a whole. It's not a monolith. And the civilization is called a civilization thanks to the scale of its diversity. So the realities, the political realities, the jati realities, the economic realities have been different in different parts of the country, but we are all painted with the same brush. So my suggestion to you is, we will keep doing this intellectual nonsense because that's a battle that has to be uh, fought at a certain level. But what is it that you can do if you have to think like a Bharatiya? Drawing from Mr. Annamalai's speech. One, temple tourism in Tamil Nadu must boom. <laughs> Repopulate our temples. Take back those spaces. Support all temple communities, the operative word being all. Use the temple to unite people. Use the temple to educate people. Bring them out of perpetual victimhood. Oh, is it too sensitive a comment? Sorry? Adhoon Alakum, wait for it, it will happen. Today our temples are held ransom by an ideology that has vowed destruction of our religion, has taken an oath for it. And they are being true to their political masters who are within and outside the country. The links go far beyond Bharat and they've entered Europe. So you have to realize the magnitude of the problem that people like Annamalai face. These battles cannot be contested alone. I have no political affiliation whatsoever. I can say this bluntly with him being on the stage. My affiliation, my fealty, my loyalty is to my community, to my dharma, period. And precisely because I see a representative of dharma in him, I will support him. It is absolutely crucial that we understand the challenges. There are a lot of issues and deliverables that are entirely within our control. The first suggestion was going to the temple. There are Sardarji's members of the Sikh community who sing in Tamil, in Kumaram Gundam and other places. I've seen that happen. That is the unity of this land. Chardham Yatra is impossible without coming to the south and Sikhs also perform the Chardham Yatra. The utter nonsense that is being peddled about this community is a direct consequence of our ignorance. In the age of internet, none of us has the excuse for being ignorant. At all. You think it's easy like somebody, for somebody like Dushan Sridhar to wear the Tripunda and go to the television and face all the people from the D-Stocks? The kind of hatred, the kind of poison, the kind of bile that is being hurled at people like him is unbelievable. How do these people function? Not on your support, but because of their inner spiritual core. Because most people think it's easy for people like him and I to take these positions because there is some popular support. None of you is going to be available. <laughs> Your intention may be to protect us, but you cannot be available all the time. 
So the point is not to protect us, but to start finding replacements for us. Keep creating them. These can't be personality-driven movements. Learn one thing from the Asura. Whenever you think of tapas, you think of the Asura. Because Asura tapas is unbelievable. Because when they commit themselves to something, they latch on to it. I learn from the Devas as well as the Asuras. I'm very clear about it. We must start looking at producing Raktabija Devas. Every drop of blood in the land of Sanatana Dharma must create more Dharmika warriors. Over the last few weeks, knowing fully well what kind of a sensitive area Jati as a topic is, I have decided to embrace the cactus by talking about it. Because it is important for us to have these conversations. The more you shy away from these conversations, you make them tab taboo topics, somebody else is going to appropriate it. Somebody else with a vested interest is going to appropriate it. There will never be a conversation with honesty. And with honesty does not mean to deny everything that has happened, but also to say, please don't exaggerate. And also remember that it is meant to bring us together. If the purpose of the conversation is to divide us further, then it is fundamentally a bad faith engagement. It is a dishonest conversation. It's a motivated malicious conversation. And that is what happens every time we touch this topic. Every incident is a potential entry point for the mischievous Dravidianist. He is waiting for it. So I would request you to use these platforms, these fora, and these institutions as a moment of societal churn. I know I'm in no position to make these suggestions, but I hope that I can make this to somebody like Sivashri, that even our concerts during Margari Masam must carry an important message. It cannot be just a Katha Kalakshepam or a pure cultural event because none of our classical arts are being, let's say, kept away from this political conversation. Every institution, whether it is dedicated to Bharatanatyam or not, is now under the attack from the left. It's being taken over. Bharata Muni will not be taught in these places apparently. Bharata Muni will not be taught in an institution which is dedicated to Bharatanatyam is the scene of the Tamil Nadu of 2020s. And whoever wants to teach Bharata Muni's Bharatanatyam and Natya Shastra is being kicked out as a Hindutva fascist Sanghi. Imagine to what extent we have come down. When your arts are being taken away, remember the one final pure strand that is left between your culture, your past and your present is sought to be severed and corrupted fully. You can't let that happen. You can't let that happen. But don't go ahead with the victimhood complex. The difference between the Dravidianists and us is that go confidently out for engagement and your outreach must be genuine to all affected parties. Let opinions change. It's not going to be an easy battle, but I can say this with confidence. I say this with confidence. Nobody can accuse me of being different about my identity, jati or religion-wise. And I have not seen my identity or opinion be a barrier when I'm engaging with confidence with people from my community, which is the Hindu community, across the board. I've had people come and speak, explain their position, genuinely express a way to bridge this gap. This is not to my credit. I am saying that there is a willing audience out there, provided you show it in action. You cannot read the, what is that? I don't want to name the newspaper anymore. <laughs> because it's not what it's meant to be. It is the antithesis of its name. The Sri Maha Mao of Mount Road. <laughs> Find a way to get on the ground. You have only three ways of contributing to this battle. 
None of which is to just earn your livelihood and get out of it. Not happening. It, it's not happening anymore. You have to participate. Financially, what can you do? Culturally, what can you do? Intellectually, what can you do? Spiritually, what can you do? And if you have the ability, politically, what can you do? I understand that politics is not everybody's cup of tea, but everything else is within your remit. It's possible for you to do it. It has come to a point where I'm being asked, are there no Hindus left in Tamil Nadu? That's the question that's coming from North India or India of the North. This question has started coming. There are no reactions. Anybody says anything. There is absolutely no expression of discontent or displeasure whatsoever when people trample all over you like human doormats. If this is incitement, so be it. I am inciting you to action. I am inciting you to action. A different kind of direct action where you actually go onto the ground and engage with people from your community. It is crucial. These 25 years will define and decide what shall be the way of the future post 2047. This is a battleground generation. Never before in the history of the last 400 to 500 years have you been presented with an option where you actually are in a position to speak with a unified political Bharat. You were speaking with different princely states at one point. You finally have a politically unified Bharat which was always civilizationally one. One, you have a politically unified Bharat. Then you have been given democratic ways of communication where you're no more dependent on the mainstream media with its own vested ideological interests. Social media has made possible the reach of voices, like all of them. Who would have thought at one point that someone coming from Arnamalai's background would be able to aspire for the best positions that this country's political system has to offer? <laughs> this is a sign of change. This is a sign of change. When somebody has to go to court to prevent the viewing of Pranapratishtha, it's a sign of desperation. It is darkness at its highest position and that's where the resistance starts. When it is darkest, that's when there is a sense of hope because effectively he's exhausted all his arsenal. His ammunition is over. He has nothing more to offer. <laughs> While I practice in Delhi, I make this abundantly clear. Urukaling a kandipa erko. Because this is the time this is the time. Those who were associated with the Ram Jaram Bhumi movement will tell you the significance of what I'm about to say. Ek dhakka or do. Every structure that is anti-dharmic must crumble. And the Overton window must change. This must become the new normal, making it impossible for anybody to take the situation back. Impossible. Thanks to what has happened over the last decade, anyone who doesn't perform on the, on the anvils of economics will not be an acceptable option anymore. Since 2014 to 2024, that is the change. Jai Shri Ram has become a national sentiment. In the land of Ram Sami, Jai Shri Ram is back. They will all be forced to confront it. Three, don't underestimate the will and the commitment and the venom of the other side. They know no boundaries, they have no standards. The definition of standard is lost on them. The concept of decency and courtesy is lost on them. That's the kind of people you're dealing with. They have no respect for women. They are the last one to speak of feminism. They shouldn't hold forth on feminism at all. None of them know how to respect women whatsoever. They shouldn't be allowed to get away with this. I know I've upset the entire script I had in mind. <laughs> but such is the effect that he has 
in terms of upsetting the established order. I thought I'll at least stick to the script I wrote and scribbled. I couldn't. <laughs> Grama Devatas and Kula Devatas are the battlegrounds, by the way. Please go back to them. Revive your Grama Devatas and Kula Devatas at the very least. Because the divide that they are hoping to succeed in is to divide temples from Grama Devatas and Kula Devatas and say, no, these are two different strands altogether. One has got nothing to do with Sanatana Dharma and this is all some Brahmin conspiracy. Please embrace those deities. I know for a fact that my own in-laws have Ayanar as the Kula Devata, which means they also serve meat and toddy. That's what these idiots don't understand. They won't understand. Every temple has a Padhati. Whatever the temple says, we will do it. Period. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me what is the origin of the priest. If the priest is a priest in a particular place of worship, you will surrender to his diktats as far as that institution is concerned. Break these silos. Since actions speak louder than words, the most powerful impact which the other side dreads is the repopulation of even the street temples, the unknown temples. Because Madurai Meenakshi will always get crowds. What about other temples? What about other temples? Go back to those temples, forge your sense of community, which is the one thing lacking in this community, and that's haunted us for thousands of years now. And our definitions of community are in micro-definitions. Let us assume for a moment that I accept the reality that these micro-definitions cannot be done away with because they have withstood the test of time for thousands of years. I can only make one point. Respect every micro-identity. Treat everybody with respect. Because if you don't do that, respect will be replaced by dangerous victimhood complex. When you do that, when you take every profession seriously, you'll realize that all the professions which were in the hands of our communities, which have been lost to others, can be reclaimed. Otherwise, they'll come and live like destitutes in cities. It's not as if Chennai has the ability to accommodate everyone who comes here. It doesn't have the resources for it. And since they know for a fact that their professions will not be respected in the places of their origin, they have no other option but to get out of the place. One is a loss of dignity. The second is a loss of opportunity. We have to address both. And that will happen when you start going back to these places, when they realize that there is more footfall. So revisiting your places of worship is not just about religion, it's equally about economics. Go to Ayodhya and you will be surprised at the infrastructure development there. I am someone who believes in respecting sanctity first and ensuring that infrastructure organizes itself around that respect for the sacred space. I don't believe in corridorification at the expense of the sacred space. But I believe both of them can go hand in hand with a sense of balance. In Ayodhya, you will not believe from some of those roads. Most of those roads are better than Chennai's roads, actually. <laughs> and Bharatiyas know how to maintain infrastructure. The, the thought, the self-loathing thought that we don't know how to maintain infrastructure, Delhi Metro has been running fantastically since 2004. It's among the best in the world. Washington is really terrible, even in terms of its metro system. Delhi is brilliant. This is happening across the country. So when someone tells you, you don't know the value of economics, you don't know the value of maintaining infrastructure, that you are not clean fundamentally, address each of these aspects. These are fundamental deliverables where he and I don't need to play a role. We have no business playing a role in that. We can only tell you, this is the big picture, find your places within. Some of these battles, it's for you to embrace. I don't want to say anything further. I'll take questions from the audience for at best 10 minutes, assuming we have the time for it. Five minutes? Fair enough. Yes, shall we hand over the mic so that it's recorded? Otherwise, I'll be accused of scripting the interview. <laughs> Thank you.
I think we'll go with lots of students first, please. Yeah, I would want to give students an opportunity first. Hello. First of all, it's an absolute honor to meet both of my heroes in real life. Um, one would be a question exclusively for you, another would be both of uh, you and Anna Malai yes, and now together, because I don't know if I'll get an opportunity again. First is, since we're in Mailapur, do you think there is credence to the fact that uh, Mailapur Temple's original location is something else? And if that's true, do you think it's possible for us to get it back? <laughs> Second question, just one moment, uh, for Anna Malayana and you together. Um, as you know, Anna, um, concurrent list, item 28, Anti is religious HRC. endowments. Yeah, yeah, got it. Why doesn't the central government, which has the power right now with an absolute majority, right. enact a law where they bring in temples not just for uh, Tamil Nadu, but for all of India, since Anna keeps saying that, um, you know, the first signature would be to remove the uh, HR and CE ministry. Right, right. Thank you so much. So, the temple reclamation question and the temple management question are two different aspects. So let me try and address one of them and, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Anamale. First, when we wanted one, they said nothing doing. Now when we're asking for the other with evidence, they're saying nothing doing. So when somebody displays that kind of intransigence, I will say then my position of minimalism has no value. Let me now have no limits on my ask at all. At all. So when I dropped the figure of 40,000 over the last two weeks, people went on fire. Oh, what did he say? Barnal Matama Vithu Boche. Every 40,000, 40,000 engineers. Are you going to get the answer? I'm going to get Because anyway, your answer is going to be Sunna. Zero. If your answer is a zero, then I have no other option but to take a maximalist position. Two, Okay, let me ask a different kind of uh, Mr. argument right now. I'll present that argument. Why haven't any of these people said, why only temples of the north, Kashi, Mathura, and Ayodhya? What about the temples of the south? Are they are apparently batting for the southerners, right? If they were Hindutva southerners, they should be saying, why only three temples of the north? What about other temples? Because they have decided for us that these are the holiest of our places. Okay. So if Mother and Meenakshi had been under occupation, would we not have asked for it? Absolutely. If Sri Rangam had been under occupation, you wouldn't have asked for it? Let someone tell me that Sri Rangam isn't among the holiest of our shrines. I dare them. Let them say Mother and Meenakshi is not. If Sabrimala was under occupation, would we not take it back? That's it. In a community that has 51 Shakti Peethas, 108 Divya Desams, 12 Jyotirlingas, what do you mean by three it's holiest of our shrines? Every community has its own holy shrine or holiest of shrines. I'm a Shaivite. For me, what is more important? As much as Ayodhya is important, Kashi is important, and if Chidambaram had been under occupation, that's equally important for me. Who are these people who are deciding for us to say, no, no, now that you want everything, limit it to three? On what basis do you decide? When you once, I mean, you have a grand position is, or a Hinduism is not even centralized. Then how do you decide that three of these places are the holiest? If it is decentralized, then the argument has to be decentralized. Let the owners and the claimants of each of those temples decide for themselves. You don't decide for it. Two. When someone says, is, does, wouldn't this lead to some kind of a conflict and all that, they said this about 370. They said this about Rama. So every time, it's, it's a subtle thread that is being dropped. I'm saying, enough, okay? Now this won't work anymore. The community has awakened. They have seen through all of this, and the evidence is right in front of your eyes, and your attitudes are also right in front of people's eyes. Enough is enough. The Supreme Court basically said that even the occupier for centuries will be given land despite having lost the case. That is the most magnanimous ask that you can get from the highest constitutional court of the country. I am saying I am willing to propose even that. Somebody asked for five villages once, I am giving you five acres now. You don't want this. Consequences will follow, time will decide. 
The master accountant is always time. It is a Kala Chakram, it will keep coming back and our time is now. Second, entry 28, I agree with you. I have said this in articles, I have said this in speeches. I think it's important for us to start forming a broader consensus. Since this ask has been limited to a, a select few people or select individuals, it has remained a storm in a teacup. My suggestion to you will be this. Strengthen his hands by making the temple freedom movement a Hindu movement and not the movement of one particular community in Tamil Nadu. I am not saying that anybody is limiting it to one particular community, but the perception needs to change and I certainly think people who are working for it are working towards it. But the other side constantly says, no, no, this is effectively a clique of a particular community that is interested in restoring its domination and supremacy. Address that. Don't run away from it. It's important to address that. Start the outreach. The legal battle will be fought. The gentleman who represented Sri Ram Lalla in the Ayodhya case, Sri C.S. Vaidyanathan, is the one who is leading us in the battle. I am second in command. So we are in very safe hands and those pair of hands belong to Sri C.S. Vaidyanathan. Remember that. People may not be aware of it, therefore it becomes my duty to inform people of this. Sri R. Venkat Ramani, who is the current Attorney General, was previously part of the team. He was at par with Mr. C.S. Vedanathan representing this matter. And then he became the Attorney General. So according to me, the stars are positioned in the right place. Please, please. Uh, dear brother, uh, we all know why you have asked this question. Normally, this thought process comes when there is a mismanagement. When something is not right, something is not managed the way it is supposed to be managed. And uh, the Tamil Nadu HRNC Act is time tested by the Supreme Court at different points of time. Especially in the case of Chidambaram Dikshidash issue, multiple cases. Now, now, visibly among the public, even a common man who is sitting in a tea stall will say, temples are mismanaged. Why I am saying this? In the last three days, if you have scanned time, had the time to scan the newspaper, you Palani Kovilla, Aralai Thore Vika Kudia Panjamaradam, Aralai Thore Stalla, Nate Kalila Ketupona Panjamaratha Vikram. Just one story in the newspaper yesterday. Day before yesterday in Avadi, in a temple run by HR and CE for the Lord, eight Savar and Nahaya Urthur Edithan. Yar Edithan Patina, part time Marchaka, not a full time, part time Marchaka, part time teacher, part time nurse, Mari, part time Marchaka. The recent audit statement of Tirchandur Muruga Temple says 5,309 cows are missing. That's why we And in the audit report they have written, we don't know where the cow is. So, this is 1986 HRNC affidavit in High Court, 2024 what they claim, we have lost 2 lakh acres of land belonging to temple. So, overall, there is a very fit case to say that temples are being thoroughly mismanaged as one. Second is disturbing the faith and the cultural process. This is the Randall process. This is where you get disturbed more. Prana Pratishtai. For a temple that is not run by HRNC in Kanchipuram. The finance minister is sitting there, like everybody there as a common audience. Wanted to watch it live. And the local police was inside the temple removing the screen and saying, you have to take permission for putting up a screen inside a private temple. In government run temples, where people wanted to do Anadana Seva, Madhyana Vandha Prana Pradhisthi Mudhi Kapara Sapad Kurukono. Very first time they said, you got to give, take permission to even to offer food inside a temple, which in Dharmic, in our Dharma, that is a part of your duty. When you apply for permission, the question are 17 questions they ask. Who prepares the food? Where the food is coming? List out all the items. How many people will eat? Mention the quantity. Then you please go and meet the JC. So in the mari. So part number two is more disturbing. One is mismanagement, of course. The part number two is a deliberate effort to stifle the way you practice your religion. Part number three is distorting your practice. Puja nadakaradhikadayadhi. That's why we are here. 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 We are here.
Now you have the specific question, is there a fit case? Yes, absolutely there is a fit case. That's why it's a political person we keep telling as a party's thing. In constituency number 100 in Sri Rangam, we say, time has come to dismantle HRNC in Tamil Nadu, which BJP, when people vote us to power, we will do. Now the very specific question of NT28 concurrent list. Two days back, Amit Shah Ji was sitting in an economic summit. There was an audience like you who asked a question. The the opposition is unhappy with the Bharat Ratna that is given. They say for politically you are given Bharat Ratna to get votes. The opposition is asking, why not Savarkar is not given Bharat Ratna? Amit Shah Ji's answer is my answer. Amit Shah Ji said, thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> Last question. Yeah. This will be the last question. Uh, sir, sir. Uh, Namaskar, sir. Jay Namaskar. Sai Deepak and Anamalai, sir. Basically, I am from Madhya Pradesh. I am pursuing my bachelor's in engineering here. Ji. So, sir, there are a lot of talks going about Hindu Rashtra. So, like, what are your opinions on Hindu Rashtra? And is Hindu Rashtra actually possible? One, yes, it's possible. Two, it merely means restoring the civilizational identity of this land and not using imported values to pixelate our identity. It doesn't mean second grade rights to anybody else, but it certainly means the preferential treatment that has been going on and on and on for over a hundred years according to me, not just over 75 years, needs to stop and particularly History needs to be acknowledged. So when we are told that in the, con in the context of jati and so on and so forth, acknowledgement of history is important and addressing that situation through social justice mechanisms is important, I fail to understand how does history suddenly become irrelevant and redundant in the context of other issues. You can't selectively say history is relevant for this and not this because this is your pain point, I'll keep doing this on a regular basis, but as far as other issues are concerned, where history is actually acting to your advantage, I will not talk about it. That can't happen. Three, my vision for Bharat is actually what I would call Pax Indica, which is Greater Bharat. What is Pax Indica? If you read history, it will speak of Pax Britannica, Pax uh, Romana, and now we are witnessing the dying gasps of Pax Americana, Pax Americana, which means it's called Roman peace or English peace or American peace, which is peace that is established under the supremacy and the leadership of a particular country, where it has the widest possible economic influence, the widest possible cultural influence, and the widest possible political influence. My vision is strengthen your position within and the immediate neighborhood of undivided Bharat should also become safe for the core identity of Bharat. That is the day you would effectively come to a point where a CAA is no more necessary. <laughs> One is to enact a CAA to address the existing situation, but the next is to come to a point where you have a stick strong enough to say no further assaults on this identity in my neighborhood at the very least. That is my larger vision. Creating a safe homeland and a safe neighborhood for perhaps the most traumatized, genocided, massacred population of the world. I leave it to Shivashri if we still have any time or if you want to wrap this up, I think. We'll wrap this up? Yes. I think we should be because I want to respect the organizer's patience and the fact that Mr. Annamalai's time is more important. So thank you, Jai Shri Ram, Vande Matram.